Okay, so this is, uh, I don't really have any notes done for you up uh, that are doodled on and stuff like that, like I've been doing all the way up to this point, uh, only because really this is a, a sort of a discussion idea. This is something we talk about in class and I talk about it in length. So we'll, I'll go over the note with you and you can read the textbook and hopefully understand this a little bit better. But this has to do with um, a causation analysis or an analysis of cause, causality, okay? And so as a result, um, there are some sort of fallacies that exist. Uh, and, and so we have to, when we see a correlation, we have to decide whether or not there actually is causation because correlations can exist without causation at all. Okay, and so that's something that we need to ascertain uh, is we're gonna get, we're gonna crunch the numbers, we're gonna get an R value, it's gonna be 0.9. It's gonna show a strong cause and a strong relationship, but that doesn't necessarily mean that X causes a change in Y. Other things could be happening in the background. So whenever you look at the numbers, don't just say the numbers don't lie because you could then have to look at the nature of the variables and find degrees to which those things can agree or disagree with each other. So this is one truth, okay? Uh, and, and this sort of does a little calculus. It sort of derives it and, and explains the necessity for all of this. But if no correlation exists, in other words, the R value is very low and there's no correlation at all or a very weak one, when mathematically analyzing a relationship between two variables, then, there's, there, then there's, there likely is not a causal relationship. In other words, no correlation means no causation. And that is a universally accepted truth. If you don't see a mathematical relationship between the two, then there's probably not a clear enough direct causal, causality between the two. In other words, X does not cause a change in Y. And we can usually accept that. Mathematics will actually, you know, um, match up with the psychology and sociology and, and, and logic and philosophy associated with the two variables. Okay, uh, this is where it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. A strong correlation, okay, a high R value or R squared value, if you're talking about a nonlinear correlation, does not, however, prove that there is a cause and effect relationship. It doesn't prove it. It suggests that it may exist, but it does not prove it at all. And this is what this establishment of causality is all about. Okay, there may be other explanations for the relationship as to x, why x changes along with y. So a thorough analysis must be done in order to ensure that truly a change in x does in fact cause a change in y. In other words, a correlation can equal a causation or cannot equal a causation depending on the analysis. And this is actually something that's assumed to be the case, that correlation equals causation. Okay, and so when we gather evidence, mathematical evidence, and the more mathematical evidence that we gather that suggests that there is, looking at it from different perspectives and in different studies, does suggest that there is causality, but there could be something else hiding in the background, either in flawed experimental design or something like that. Okay, so in your book, there's a couple of instances uh, that they talk about. Uh, what could be causing a high R value or R squared value and some sort of correlative principle between the two of them. Okay, the first most obvious one is, hey, it actually is true. There is a cause and effect relationship. Uh, maybe you're looking at, I don't know, the, the, the performance of a student on a test, uh, uh, their mark, uh, as a relation to how many hours they, pe they pe spend studying for that test or preparing for that test. Generally, you would see that as you increase your study time, there probably will be an increase in, in your test mark. And that's usually the case. Now, it may not necessarily be linear, it could be sort of asymptotic, or it could be something like that. But the whole point is it doesn't necessarily mean that there's, um, there's a causation. But in this case, if there's a cause and effect relationship, you know, most people will probably agree. The more that you study, the more likely it is that you're going to actually do well on the test. And you study more and you'll do better and you won't miss those odd questions here or there. You'll cover more content. And if you study less, then maybe you'll miss some stuff or an example that your teacher went over. And as a result, if it's on the test, do a little bit less, less well on it. So that there probably would be a reasonable explanation that studying and, of course, uh, performance on a test is probably one goes with the other one. Now, you could also argue against that, okay? And, and when things are not so perfect, 
like you know number of deposits that you put into a bank account of fifty dollars each causes an increase in the the bank account balance that's going to be an obvious cause and effect relationship but when we're dealing with something like studying which is not a perfect science and performance on tests which is not a perfect science then there's a possibility of all kinds of other factors playing a role okay and that's where we start looking at other things that are happening okay the, the textbook uses an example these are again textbook answers a change in x produces a change in y in other words on a clear sunny day in the summer the higher the temperature the quicker you'll get sunburned in other words there's a correlation between temperature and sunburned or uv index and sunburn okay if that's the case and that's that's a, a clear causality in that situation generally one directly causes the other now of course there are other factors that could play a role and so that's when we look at other possibilities that can exist. One possibility, which is a little bit quirky, is a reverse cause and effect relationship. Okay, with a reverse cause and effect relationship, it's not X that's causing a change in Y, it's actually Y that's causing a change in X. Okay, so if we go back to that example of studying for a test, okay, and you would figure that the more you study for a test, the better you do on a test. But that's studying before the test. If I was looking at hours spent studying and a test, and I looked at the hours spent studying after you got a test mark back, if your test mark on unit one was low, you may spend more time studying the next test just to prepare yourself for that process. And as a result, you're actually why, how well you did on the test actually changes the amount of study time that's involved. So the cha a change in X, or sorry, change in Y could actually cause a change in X. And that's when there's a reverse relationship going on in there. Okay, the example that your textbook uses is there's a positive correlation between the amount of coffee consumed by adults and their level of nervousness and anxiety. It could also mean, though, that the more anxious you are, the more likely you are to drink coffee and the more of it you'll drink to help calm you down. So who knows who goes with what? It's kind of like, you know, uh, I don't know, height um, and weight. Generally, there's, a, there's as height increases, weight increases, but that has to do with specific body types and things like that. There could be other factors that are playing a role. As weight increases, well, generally height doesn't increase, but if you're looking at something like, for example, the size of your feet and the size of your uh, hands, okay, you would see a positive correlation between the two of them, but you likely wouldn't think that, that your hand size causes a change in your foot size and so on, but it does have to do with your body type, which again brings us to another possible source of causality. Now, the, these ones that are sort of in the middle here, um, I guess the last one, which is the most obvious uh, and extreme, I'll get to in a second, but there's presumed relationships and common cause factor relationships. In presumed relationships, you would think that a change in X causes a change in Y, but there could be many other factors that play a role in how well or how, how something happens. Let's go back to that amount of hours studied and how well you do on the test. If the amount of hours studied is before the test, and then you're looking at how well you did on the test. There's all kinds of other factors. A teacher or a parent would presume that the amount of time that you spend studying for something equals a better test mark. But if the material is very, very difficult, like for example, I had a lot of difficulty with physics in university, um, or if maybe uh, we're talking about intellectual ability or talent, or it could even be the teacher, if the teacher's a better teacher or worse teacher, or it could be online learning versus not online learning versus learning in a class. Uh, look, learning in, in different models and situations in different ways with different styles from different teachers or different teaching styles. There could be all kinds of factors so that you would presume that the more that you study, the better you would do on the test. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's actually true causality between the two. There could be many other hidden factors or lurking variables that are in there. Okay, so this is kind of sort of like a a social construct where you think that the two would correlate, but they don't necessarily. Kind of like a I don't know, a prejudice or a, uh, um, a bias or a slant that someone has as an opinion of something. Okay, and so that's an example of a presumed relationship. And in the textbook, they talk about a presumed relationship where, uh, you know, there's a positive correlation between a person's fitness level and the number of action movies they watch. Well, you know, the more physically fit you are, maybe the more likely you are to watch more action movies. But there's no direct causality. Working out or, or being in great health doesn't necessarily mean that you love action movies, you could love romantic comedies, or you could love horror, or you could love something else. It doesn't mean that the two would correlate with each other. So there's a presumption. 
Okay, like, you know, people would presume that, you know, the, the more time I spend, for example, as a coach for football, uh, that I would watch all kinds of football on TV, but I don't tend to watch too much football on TV at all. Okay, and so as a result, there isn't necessarily a correlation. You would presume that there's a correlation in there. Okay, and there's all kinds of other factors that can play a role. Another example of something that could happen is a common cause factor, and that's a situation where the two variables, variables correlate, but the reason why those two variables correlate doesn't have to do with the direct causation between the two. In actual fact, it has to do with something else that's happening in the background. Okay, and so it's that level of causality which is a little bit more difficult to ascertain. Okay, so the example that they use here, which actually is kind of funny, but still a good one, is the graph of ice cream sales, so obviously how well ice cream is selling, versus the tomato harvest, how many tomatoes are harvested in a particular harvest year. And you would say to yourself, there's no relationship between those two, but in fact, there is a common cause between the two. So they may correlate. They may have an R value of 0.95 when you look at tomato harvest and when you look at... Um, when you look at ice cream sales. But what the, what the factor is in the background that's causing those two to correlate with each other is something uh, that has to do with maybe the weather. Maybe there's a lot of, uh, it's a really, really warm, hot summer. And if it's a warm, hot summer, then obviously people are gonna be out having lots of ice cream to cool them and enjoy it as a treat in the, in, you know, in the evenings or in the afternoons. And at the same time, of course, uh, there's also gonna be the tomatoes which are, which are gonna be growing much better than they would normally. And as a result, you know, there you go. You're gonna have the two correlate with each other. We see this a lot even with competitors uh, when we look at sales. Uh, that it'd be strange because if, you know, sales at like, I don't know, Tim Hortons and sales at Starbucks are, are correlating with each other, maybe a positive correlation. So as one increases, the other one increases. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, because they're competitors, right? If, I, if I'm going to go to Starbucks, it means I'm not going to go to Tim Hortons. But it could have to do with the fact that it's the time of year, or maybe it's, it's the time of day, or maybe, you know, a lot of people are going for coffees, no matter what it is, and there's just two different groups of people that are going, and so those two values are correlating with each other. Another common example of this um, is, is a medical study, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on, uh, because I want to talk about it in the structure of how we can work to or look at critically these events in order to eliminate these possibilities or at least ascertain what cause what causes what so so we'll come back to that study that shows um, that shows uh, drinking alcohol and cholesterol levels or drinking different types of alcohol and cholesterol levels okay anyway uh, so one way in which one other example of course uh, is an accidental relationship and that's an accidental relationship really just says that basically it's an accident that the two of them correlate with each other you would probably say that about tomato harvest and and ice cream sales and if you couldn't find that hidden third variable common cause that was creating them to correlate with each other you may say to yourself it's just an accident that these two correlate with each other Okay, and so that could be something like, I don't know, like the, I don't know, the, the, the length of your hair and how much money that you make, right? There could be no correlation with that whatsoever, but yet there could be a mathematical relationship between the two of them. Okay, and if the mathematical relationship exists, it could be an accident if you can't really realistically see why X would cause a change in Y. Okay, and you can you know do studies and and break things down and start stripping down all the variables and seeing what's what, um, and then that would maybe help you see that there actually is a clear causality between the two, but there could be accidental relationships, and that is something that you can explain away. So how do we get past that? How do we critically look at an experiment? How do we understand whether or not it's a common cause, it's a presumed relationship, it's accidental, or it's cause and effect? Okay, well, what we often do when we look at things is we look at this, the experiment itself. We look at who we gather the data from, we look at the sampling process, we look at all kinds of different things. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a critical analysis. But how do I do this ahead of time? How do I design an experiment so that it is truly a cause and effect relationship? Well, what we want to do is we want to re reduce these things called extraneous variables. These are variables that can actually cause causality or mix up causality um, by having all kinds of other factors that play a role. So, for example, if I wanted to look at the effectiveness of diet and weight loss, there's all kinds of other features that play a role, okay? These extraneous variables. It could be the amount of exercise that you have. It could be the lifestyle that you lead. It could be the type of food 
that you eat. It could be the not just the calories, but the nature of the calories that you consume. It could be not just the fat levels, but the nature of the fat that you consume. It could be when you eat. It could be how often you eat in small snacks or in large meals. It could be the fact that maybe your the other genetic factors are playing a role, or maybe your body type, you're a mesomorph or an ectomorph or an endomorph. There's all kinds of different types of ways and when your metabolism levels, your age, these could all play a role. And so what you want to do is you want to eliminate those variables one by one by designing an experiment. And very often what you'll do when you do that is you design an experiment so that you have blind tests and then you, you have placebos and you have control groups and all kinds of other features. So let me give you an example of blind tests and things like that and how one would go to eliminate that. So let's look at an example of a, of a study that happened in the past where we thought there was causality, but it was actually a common cause. Okay, what they found was uh, as you increase the amount of red wine, uh, there would be a lowering of your cholesterol. Okay, so they surveyed people and they found that the more red, red wine they drink as a choice of alcohol, then um, their cholesterol would be lower. So what they thought was, well, maybe there's a causation. Maybe you should start recommending as doctors for people to drink wine rather than other types of alcoholic beverages so that they could lower their cholesterol. What they didn't realize was there was a hidden or lurking variable. What they found out in those studies when they looked at them further is that the red wine drinkers were often people who could afford the red wine. And if you could afford red wine, okay, then you had the money, okay, to buy foods that were a little bit lower in cholesterol. So the hidden variables that were in there was not the whole idea. If you bought lots of red wine, you had lots of money. If you had lots of money, then you had the ability maybe to have a gym membership. You had the ability to have a little bit more spare time to prepare meals. You also had more money to buy more consumable goods like fruits and vegetables and things like that as alternatives, okay, to maybe fast foods and things like that that may be higher in fat and higher in sugar, okay, that would, that would raise your cholesterol. So what they found out was the correlation wasn't between red wine and cholesterol. The correlation was between the amount of money that people had and their cholesterol, and more specifically, the money that could affect the diet that could then affect their cholesterol levels. Okay, so as a result, it really didn't have much to do with the red wine. So that's an example of a common cause factor of money or diet that really affects cholesterol rather than red wine affecting cholesterol levels. So how would one design an experiment to control for these? Well, what you would want to do is you want to eliminate all kinds of variables. Now, how would you do that? Well, you could ask questionnaires that relate to the type of foods that you eat, when you eat, um, also look at all kinds of other demographic factors. We know that cholesterol is affected definitely by diet and what you consume, so why wouldn't you consider not just the alcohol as a consumption feature, but also the other features? Now, obviously, when I do a test like this, I can't kidnap a thousand people and send them off to a resort and control their food. Okay, and control their red wine intake and then look at their cholesterol levels. I'm not an evil scientist. But I could do a study to look at, for example, um, I don't know, cholesterol levels when I'm doing a drug test. Okay, so let's say I have a drug that I've developed and it's designed to lower cholesterol. Okay, so I'm going to look at my drug and as I increase my doses of my drug, I'm hoping it's going to, not increase, I'm hoping it's going to decrease my cholesterol. But you've got all kinds of features that could affect that. Just because you give a drug to a person does not mean that it's gonna lower their cholesterol. And more importantly, just because you give a drug to a person doesn't mean they're all gonna eat the same diet and fault the diet that you prescribe for them as a doctor. They're not gonna do it. These are humans, these are people. So what you wanna do is you wanna eliminate factors. Okay, you wanna include controls. So you look at the factors that affect cholesterol, like you look at age, maybe even gender. You could even look at, um, uh, socioeconomic factors. And what you do is what you, you, is you create groups where all of these things are relatively controlled. You only take people who are between, I don't know, 50 and 60 years of age. You either take males or females or equal numbers of males and equal numbers of females and look at them separate and look at them together to see if they're in effect. Try to get people of the same socioeconomic status or at least control for that variable and so on and so on and so forth. Another control you would want to include, of course, would be diet. You'd have to put them on a very strictly prescribed diet and so on. And you may say to yourself, that's impossible to do. But I'm putting in all of these controls 
for this simple reason. I want my drug to be the only thing that causes a change in the cholesterol. If they're the same age and the same gender and the same socioeconomic status and the same diet and they're, they're following that prescribed diet and they're following the proper amount of exercise, then at least I know there's more of a likelihood that my drug is actually causing a direct effect with my cholesterol. Okay? And so you want to introduce those. Now there's other problems that exist. Okay? There's something called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is interesting because what ends up happening is people who are taking a drug think that they're going to get better. As a result of them thinking that they're going to get better, they actually physiologically start to get better. I don't know how it works. I don't know. Maybe it has to do with stress hormones or has to do with all kinds of other psychological factors. But I do know that what happens is this is a real effect. Okay? And so what you need to do is you also need to control, you know, taking a pill. Because if you have part of your group that doesn't take the pill, that's your control group, to see that nothing happens or maybe the cholesterol doesn't change much, and then the individuals who take maybe one pill and then two pills and then three pills for different doses, then you could look at a dose-dependent effect. But you definitely want to have a control group of zero. And that control group of zero pill, if you don't give them a pill, then the people who take the pill could feel better because they had the pill rather than because they had the drug that's in the pill. A placebo is, is a sugar pill. So what you would do is you would give the people that you don't want to give the drug the same number of pills. Maybe you give them five pills, but the five pills just have nothing in it, right? No drug. And then you give the people that you want to give one pill, you give them one pill, and then the rest of the four of them that they have don't have anything in them. Or you give them one-fifth the dose, and when they have five pills, then they have one dose. And for the people who have two doses and three doses, everybody gets treated the same way and, and takes the same number of pills. And so as a result, what you do is you eliminate the effect of getting the pill, the placebo effect. So this is how careful you have to be when you design these studies. The other problem happens, okay, because a placebo effect is something called a blind test. And there's all kinds of ethical issues with the blind test. But the take-home message is, is you want the people that you're testing to be blind to whether or not they're getting the drug. Because if they think they're getting the drug, they may, they may get better, not because of the drug, but because they feel like they're getting better. Okay? Or if they know that they're not getting it, they may be like, whatever. And then that's going to make them depressed or whatever, and then they're not going to do as well. Okay? So then a blind test, that's how it works. There's also something called a double blind test. And of course, the people who are getting the drug are blind, but also the people who are measuring the cholesterol level of the people are also blind. Okay, and I know that seems ridiculous, but if I'm a nurse or a doctor or someone who's part of this study and I know, hey, this is group B, group B gets the drug and group A doesn't get the drug, I may actually look for a change in cholesterol that actually isn't there and misinterpret it as what it is or what it isn't. And that's a bit of a problem, right? So, so you need to have a double blind test so that people don't know who are taking the drug and the people who are measuring them don't know that they're taking the drug. There's even a triple blind test. And a triple blind test is even more interesting because not only do they have the people who are taking the drug not know, the people who are uh, measuring don't know, but they also have the people who are analyzing the data afterwards still don't know. They don't know what's what. So they, they, they code them. Oh, this is group A, group B, group C, group D. You don't know who group A is. You don't know who group B is. You don't know who group C is. You don't know who group D is. The measuring people don't know. The people who are doing it certainly don't know, the, the subjects. And then the people who are analyzing the effectiveness of the drug are going to say, okay, well, you know what? I don't know which group is which, but I know that group C did the best. Group B, not so much. Group A and group D, nothing. And then you would go back and you would say, oh, okay, well, it just so happens that group B, the one that did the best, actually had the most drug. And the one that, that did, not, did not so well had a little bit less drug. And then the real low dose of drug was group D, and then group A was the, the, the group that had no drug whatsoever. And so that's a triple blind test, because even the people who crunched the numbers who were looking for the results, they still don't know which group is the one that actually is the drug. And that's how they run drug trials. Okay, and it's a very important way to make sure that you're getting true causality or implementing all the controls that you need to in your particular experiment. Okay, so again, look for causality. Look for those hidden and lurking variables. Look for those other features that can exist. And we're going to work on the next video something called a critical analysis.